Hello and welcome to Design Education Talks, the collaboration between New Art School and Design Didax Podcast. Our guest today is Christopher Scott. Welcome, Christopher. Hello, Lepteris. Uh, thank you for the kind invitation. Oh, it's fantastic to have you here. So tell us That's about amazing. you. Wow, well, so that's a big question. Um, so um, I'm a graphic designer. Um, I have two principal roles now or, where I'm based, which is I'm the founder and president of the Ecuador Poster Biennale here in Quito, Ecuador. And also I'm a professor of graphic design here in the Universidad de Ute. And uh, also I am a, a professor, a invited professor in, in China and also in Serbia. Um, so that's the main roles that I, uh, that I have now. Um, but my beginning to graphic design came in 2002. I was 16 years old and I started my own graphic design studio. And which was called CS Graphic, which is an Irish, um, which was an Irish graphic design studio. Uh, a shout out to Chris Murphy. I watched his um, episode a couple of weeks ago, and it was great to see another Irish um, a person in your podcast. It was very good. Um, and then from there, um, for the, in the CS Graphic studio, I designed logos, branding. In those days, there was no social media. There was no um, website. Was website design was starting to get in, but not really. Um, and I did mostly advertising posters, um, branding for agencies, and stuff like that. And it was only a small studio. It was only a couple of people. Um, and then I moved on to get my title in design, and uh, I continued to work for many people. A, in my studio and also I was um, part of other studios also um, then a, I did a, the start of my master's in 2010 and just around that time my interest, did, a, interest started in social design and the responsibility we have as social designers and that started like basically at 2009, 2010, um, it changed my emphasis of an advertising designer until uh, now I more recognized as like a social poster designer. Um, then I did my master's and I didn't know why I was doing my master's at the time. And then when I finished my master's and at the end of 2011, um, I got, I traveled to Ecuador for the first time, which was in March, 2012, if I'm correct. And that's where, um, I did a conference here. I did a workshop and then I got invited to, to change my life forever and change from Ireland to Ecuador. And there was a big, big difference, big change culturally, a big change. I left everything. I left my studio um which was I, I didn't want to bring the studio with me to our to ecuador it was like an irish studio that was the whole emphasis um and it just changed everything um, and i've been in ecuador since 2012 i'm still here now and and that's the short version of a very long story okay. um the best way i can yeah fantastic this is, this is fantastic are you, are you but you're still designing um, uh, right now, um, yeah, I would have maybe like one client per year based on my schedule. So like my schedule is I'm a full-time teacher. I'm also the, the invited uh, professors in China and Serbia. So I have classes to give there. I have to travel sometimes to other countries. And also I, I do lots of conferences and other events in different parts of the world, which yeah. is very important to me. Um, and I also have the Ecuador poster we now, which is that, that the, the big event here that we have in Ecuador for poster design and graphic design in general. And uh, apart from all that schedule and all that work, I would uh, select, because I have lots of proposals all the time. Can Christopher, can you do this brand for us? Christopher, can you do this logo design, typography, font design, whatever yeah. they want? Mostly, most of the time it's like branding projects. Um, but I would only select, uh, I have the look and I have the 
privilege to select the client that I want to work with. So I would only do one, one per year. Um, but it would be a long process, not just like a simple logo and then of course, it would of course. generally be like maybe three, four, five months, maybe. Yeah. So tell us about the post of Bianelli. So um How did you I start? Arrived, so I arrived, yeah. So I arrived in Ecuador and like I said before in 2012. Um and it it started where I came to Ecuador and I noticed instantly that Ecuador has a lot of talent. Oh, um, a lot of um, a lot of creativity in in the, in the country for graphic design, for visual arts. Um, and I was thinking to myself, what what what's possible here? Because also when you when you think of the international design is a scenario, you never hear Ecuador, right? You, you always think of New York and America and Europe and, and all these uh, big continents and countries, right? So I was thinking to myself, we need a platform. We need something here to show what the Ecuadorian design is because it's absolutely amazing. Like there's some amazing designers. Like if I start if I start naming some, everyone will get upset because I missed their name. So, um, but there's it's amazing. Like uh, so, we started thinking. I start thinking, and, and, I, and some people I, that I'm close to, let's do something. Let's make an event. Let's make a project that we can show the work of the Ecuadorian people to an international, um, a, international. A scale on an international scale, and so uh, I mean, I was in Ecuador. I was getting um, climatized to the different food, which I still I'm not a big fan of. I'm still I'm like an Irish an Irish boy, so I love all my my chips and my potatoes and things like that. But um, so what I did was I was okay. First couple of years, I was getting used to the country, making contacts, making relations, and in 2015. Um, I sat down with my friend uh, Santiago Gomez and we were like, what can we do, Christopher? What can we do to, to promote more of graphic design and the importance for design for, the society, for society and the importance of design for Ecuador and the world in general? And we came up with some ideas, but the main one that was in our head the whole time was let's make a Biennale. Let's make an event, huge, like a big event where there's competitions, there's conferences, there's workshops. And we invite the best designers in the world all to come to Ecuador, the center of the world, to um, to showcase the importance of design nationally and internationally. And, and that's when it all started. And we did the first edition, uh, which was in 16, 2016, which is a huge success. We received over 9,000 posters from 84 countries um, for the competition. And then we had the Congress, which had designers under Lewis from Canada, which is an amazing designer. We also had Richard Doubleday, who's a very famous American designer. And Javier Perez, which is very famous in Ecuador. And, and we had conferences and workshops and it was very, very successful. Then we did the 2018 edition, which, which was even bigger. Um, we had a, a Julius Wiedemann from... Um, the director of Tashin and one of the, the main directors of Domestica. And we had a big, and we also received in the 2018 edition um, over 10,000 posters for the competition. And we were getting ready for a 2020 edition and then COVID hit. And that was a big uh, hit for us. And many people were thinking, oh, maybe we're going to stop the project and stuff. But we were like, no, we need to continue. So we did like a digital, a digital um, event. Um, with a virtual gallery, which was amazing, uh, different experience. And then now we're planning the 2022 edition, which is going to be um, absolutely crazy, which actually, I don't know when this podcast is going to go live, um, but it will be launched on the 1st of August, um, the, oh. the next Biennale. Wow. Um, uh, and that's probably like as a news, maybe a news plus for your for your community because uh, a lot of people are excited in the graphic design and poster area uh, for the new edition. So we're oh, fantastic. We're, we're so you're lo you're launching this August. 
Yeah, this this August starts the 2022 edition. We always plan things way before. So yeah. we launch it and then we start planning for so the, the the event and the exhibitions, conferences, workshops are are always on the October of the um of the like 2022 or October 2024 in in that case. So but we always uh, make the call for posters like uh, for like six, seven, eight months. Yeah. So like the people have time to receive the work. And then whenever the news, the reason why we do a lot before, because people have to print the posters, send it to another country yeah. and stuff like that. So it's a long process. We start a, the planification for each edition is always 18 months of planification. So when they, when the, uh, uh, on 2019, January, 2019, we started the planification for 2020. Yeah. So we did basically 12 months of work, funding, getting all the conference people, getting all the posters, getting everything ready. And it all came nothing because of COVID. So that was a big hit. Um, it was uh, 12, 12 months of uh, work for, for basically nothing. So hopefully uh, the 2020 will be big and I'm sure it will be. So we're all super excited for, for that. Um, yeah. Fantastic. So what makes, what makes the Ecuador Biennale unique? So that's the thing, right? So whenever uh, we started in 2015, we were we looked at the the market space in terms of like uh, biennales and, and and events like that, and we were like, what's what's something's missing? So we realized very quickly that for a biennale, like some of the most famous ones are like in Poland, uh, Mexico, um, in China, um, and we realized very instantly that it's very like only the best designers get into it. Like it, it's like the elite. It's like it's like the Milton Glazers, it's the Stefan Sagmeisters, David Carson, all those people are are, are that, that that's their aim, that's their target. What we realized very instantly is that we need to make a platform that anyone can submit. For example, we have a category only for students. Normally, biennales are not aimed at students, they're aimed at um, only professionals, like the big shots, right? So what we did. Of course, the big shots receive, we receive the work from the big shots and the big designers, but also we have a category only for students. We were one of the first biennales in the world to do that. And also we realized very instantly that normally in a biennale, you need to um, print your work, send your work in a tube with all like the formal uh, the inscription forms and all that stuff. And we cut that out instantly. We were like, no, we don't want to do that because that, for example, if I want to send a, a, on a, one of my works to another country, like in Europe, from Ecuador, I need to buy the tube, and the tubes aren't expensive. They're like maybe $20, $20 maybe, $30. I need to also print the work in really good quality. That's expensive also. That's maybe $50, $60. Plus, I need to send it by DHL or whatever. That's another $50, $60, $70. And if to send one poster to another Biennale, you're talking maybe $200. So that's only for one poster. If you want to print, uh, send more, and you're not even selected. You only submit. You're sending it. So yeah. we cut that part. We cut that part out, and we were like, no, let's all do online submission. And if you're selected, then you can send the work. Um, so we were a uh, uh, me and uh, the team did an uh, analysis before we did the project. Okay, what is missing, and what can we do better? Uh, and that's some of the aspects that we did um, to make it better. One more would probably be to make everything more transparent. Um, all the process, the, the communications that we did uh, through the Biennale project, everything is published online. Everything is through social media. We're in direct communication with them all the ways, all the time, giving news, giving information, giving clear, specific uh, uh, information that everyone needs so that um, there's no uh, confusion in that way. So I think we were one of the first biennales in the world in terms of the poster to be really direct with the participants, to be really direct with the people who are going to be part of our community. And that's that's the key to any project or any biennale is that community. Uh, and we uh, are, are, are always every day posting information when we're doing things, what's happening. Obviously, some things are secrets. Uh, I'm not going to tell people the jury, for example, 
we and also the invited people we already have everything confirmed i'm not going to say that because all that stuff needs to be um uh, uh, some things need to be a surprise but most things uh, we're very we very important our communication and um, with the with the community of the bnl fantastic so how, how did you find uh because the same thing happened to design education forum last year exactly the same thing it was going to happen in valencia but uh one month before it uh, had to be virtual Cancel. so yeah. how did you find taking something that was being planned for for a physical event taking it to a virtual platform it was very difficult letters to be honest letters is very very difficult and but the the beautiful thing of the team of the bnl which is a small team we only have like 10 people working in the project um, but there's 10 people that is very committed to the, the cause. And a shout out to Viviana, Felipe, Luis, um, Duval, eh, Oscar, and all the people in the, in the back of the team. It's like just an amazing team that even though they get punched in the face, they get back up again. Like they're, they're like a, and it was a big, it was a knockout blow. It was a knockout blow, right? For everyone, right? Like, like you said before, it's very difficult, right? But the thing is the test of any team or any project is okay. There's, and I said to my team very clearly on in a meeting after everything happened, okay, we have this problem. What is the solution? Let's make a solution. Let's push forward. Let's be positive. And that's what we did. And we made a beautiful uh, virtual gallery, um, which is three floors uh, of, of posters. And we also made uh, digital online events through Facebook streaming and things like that, and um, which was very successful. And we also had some other launches and some other events. And we did something called... a. Uh, EPB festival during that time, which is more online experience. And we just had to adopt and we just had to change or right. or the way of thinking because we were like really good and really experienced at making physical events because that's, that's what we've been doing since 2015. Um, but we, and we had to just change our whole mentality and it's a big experience, but um, big challenge also. But uh, we were very happy with the results and um, uh, what happened uh, with the final results that we had. But but yeah, it was it was very difficult to be honest. Did how, what? Did, how did you find it? What yeah, it was you? it was very challenging. It was very challenging because uh, yeah. <laughs> I, how did you how did you solve? Are all your events free to to attend or are they ticketed? Uh, no, the Congress of the Biennale and yeah. all the workshops and stuff like that, or that you pay, you pay. There's so a, what, you, what you platform did you use for that? No, that's the thing. Right. So the, when we changed to the online, yeah, where everything was free, right? Because yeah. Yeah. Um, we we uh, made a decision in in the during the COVID yeah. that it's not it's not right to charge yeah. people. Yeah during this difficult yeah. time where people's it's, losing their job and things like that. The, uh -huh. the same thing happened with Design Education Forum. Uh, uh -huh. It was it was free. Uh, in fact, yeah, there was, um, there was a, there are some very good tools right now for that. Uh, and that, and the for, on the forum before you had to pay, right? Or, or what? No, no, the forum that before that was, 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 was free as well. At the, the physical edition? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Now, see, that, 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 that was the big challenge for us because the, the, the uh, because our sponsors, they, they, we, we, we had to sign an agreement with our sponsors that the sponsors, we, you have to make it free. So that's, okay, what, okay. So that's what happened. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. They think, yeah, but the, the thing is because we, for us, the Congress was um, in the event here in Ecuador, the physical event, the Congress, uh, you pay um, for yeah. an entrance and also the workshops. The, all the galleries, um, all like the exhibitions, they're all free to the public. Yeah. Um, but then again, like we had to find a way of changing that system because we made a decision as a team. It's not right to charge or make an online event uh, and, and charge people during the COVID and stuff like yeah. that. And um, but so yeah, we had to find other ways of how we're going to make it work. And 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 due to the, due to the generosity of 
um, a VART, um, which is a company in Poland. They helped us a lot with the virtual exhibition and things like that. So, but yeah, it was a big challenge and my, my team did an amazing job, to be honest. I'm very proud of them. Um, they did an amazing That's job. I, 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 still, I still can't believe that we did it, to be honest. Um, very, very happy with the results. So are you working on any other projects? Another, any other projects? Um, I was working on another project, on a big project. Unfortunately, it fell through um, because of, I'm not going to get into it. I'm yeah. just going to say it was fall through because uh, I don't want to make people unhappy. Um, but yeah, it just fell through. Um, we were working on the project for maybe five or six months. Wow. And then... Yeah, and then we were we did week meetings every week, but it just fell through. So unfortunately, um, the biggest um, thing that I'm working on now is um, actually it happened I, again. I don't know when this launches, but um, it uh, on the 26th of June, which is next Saturday, um, we have the launch of the Milton Glaser documentary. Um, everyone knows Milton Glaser, right? He, he designed the I Love New York logo, the Bob Dylan poster, um, and a lot of other famous works. And we, uh, or we had this idea because Milton Glaser pa sadly passed away last June. So we were like, let's, let's do something for him. And we didn't want just to make something very simple. We want to make something very special. Um, so um, Luis Lopez, which is the art director of communication in the Biennale, said, okay, let's try to make something really special, like a documentary where people talk about why Milton Glaser is important and also Milton Glaser can hopefully talk also, but then he, he, but then he passed, suddenly passed away. But thanks to the School of Visual Arts, Stephen Heller, and also thanks to um, the Copper Hewitt Gallery and also Offset Festival in Ireland, they let us use their archives of their interviews of Milton Glaser. And also we invited 30 people like Stefan Sagmeister, Stephen Heller, Seymour Quast, um, and, and Peter Mosfeld and, and lots of other big designers to give testimonials of um, why Milton Glaser was important for our society. So it's a documentary where con original content, original interviews with Milton Glaser with the people talking about him also. It's actually very sad um, because there's a very lot of, a, a, a lot of tears to be honest on the documentary because people are very um obviously sad about passing the probably the best designer ever to live on our planet um and we launched that next saturday and thankfully uh, uh, we are a big thanks to the milton glazer studio and the wife of milton uh, has been in contact with us and and she gave the approval that we can use the, the, the help of the studio. We can use the, um, the support of the studio also to make the project, the documentary, which we launch on uh, next Saturday, which is going to go on YouTube. And so you can guys can all check it out. It's, but it's amazing. It's like 30 minutes long. Wow. And it's, very, it's one of the most important projects that I've ever done um, because it's a it's Milton Glaser. Yeah. And he's like, he's like amazing. So... Um, you can actually see I'm getting a wee bit emotional about it because every time I see certain things about it, it's like very sad. Yeah. But it's it's a tribute to a great a great man, to be honest. Yeah. And so yeah, we're we're super we're super looking forward to the launch. We're super excited, and hopefully, um, hopefully it, it, we do Milton proud. Fantastic. So, in the in your teaching, uh, there's been tremendous challenges. Uh, as well, like yes. the Biennale. Uh, how do you deal with uh, sort of the, the, the issue of employment and apprenticeships for the students? What are the ways that you have found uh, to deal with the online, offline approach? Um, so that, that's the thing is that when, when we're teachers, um, I think it's very important to teach the students real life experience, to get them ready for going into a studio. Many times as teachers, we focus on the, too much on the academic side of things, like looking at other books and looking at content from books and then sharing information from books to a student. What I try to do whenever I'm teaching my students uh, is to get, 
to try to give them advice that I had, experiences that I had to get them ready for the real world, um, to get ready for the real world in terms of being like what we're doing now, digital terms or, or even by physical events. But it's, that's what the key is. It's like yeah. giving them real advice. So I would always talk to my students about, okay, um, this is experience that I had in a studio. This is how you, my advice is for handling it. Uh, and things like that. I try to always go back to what I did whenever I had my own studio, when I had a position of art director in Ireland, when I was a junior designer also in Ireland and things like that. And yeah. giving those experiences is, is to them is for me is, is very valuable. It's not just telling the students about kerning and telling the students about the theory of color. That's, they're valuable, but for me, what's more important is getting the students ready mentally mentally that's the thing mentally ready for going into the real world of graphic design because there's that's a, a big um the big difference between a classroom t uh, and the going into the to the a studio big Absolutely. A huge difference a big Absolutely. difference and the thing is i try to bridge that gap i try to make um I try to make my classes feel like a studio and not really like a classroom. Yeah. Um, and I try not to be that I'm like the teacher. I'm more like the guide. Yeah, of course. Um, I, I don't really, I think that the best teachers uh, don't teach. I think the best teachers, the best teachers inspire. Um, they don't just uh, do like a read a book or read theories. They inspire the the, the students to be the best version that they can be. I think that's the art of teaching. Sure. Um, uh, absolutely. I 100% I, I agree. However, how, how has that changed since you had to do things virtually? And, and it has changed a lot, to be honest, a lot. Um, because I really miss being in the, in, a, in, in the classroom with the students, walking around, talking to them, checking the work. And it's becoming a lot more where you go into a Zoom and you see letters, you don't see faces, you don't see reactions, you, you, because that's what design is about. It's that human contact, it's that human relation, human relationship. It's like when you send an email to a client of a logo proposal, and if you only send the PDF, normally 99% of the time the reaction is bad. It's the, the design is about going and meeting the client, showing the work and showing the, that reaction. So I think that design in these times had, a, from the transition to online and offline has adopted, but still not ready. It, we're still not ready for that uh, online way of thinking in terms of like classrooms and stuff like that. Um, I do think that uh, teaching is about being in a room, being together, working together like a workshop, a, and, and having that con human connection yeah. and and what I hope that at the end of this, this year that we go back to that scenario don't get me wrong internet internet um, um, online methods of teaching some work uh, for some classes that's another thing that's very important it's like it also depends on the class and um, what what you're teaching but um, some work and some don't, um, like Skillshare and Domestica and all those platforms are very interesting. But I still think that um, there is something very valuable about being in a room, teaching in front of a classroom, um, and, and being around people, being around the students, giving them feedback, because that's why uh, people study graphic design in my university because they, they, they want to be around the teachers, be around Absolutely. me and all those things like that. But, but it's very difficult and we had to adapt some way. I try to do things that in the same way that I did before, but um, yeah, to be honest, it's been very difficult. Um, but like everything, we need to adapt and make the best, the best of it that we, that we can. Um, there's no other way. Try to be positive, push forward and that's it. If there were no limitations, uh, what would you do? What would you do differently in, in teaching in design education? If there's no limitations, so it, 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 is the question in, in relation to Ecuador or in general? 
let's say you are where you are right now. Yeah. Yeah. In your in your institution. Okay. Yeah. But you had no limitations. Right. Of space, of funding, of of anything. How, how what would you change? Right. So yeah, I think it's a good it's a it's a good way of it, of taking it in terms of like Ecuador, right? Because um or where the situation where I'm at now. So I I think for me in education the the most there's three pillars, right? So for me the the, the pillar number one is like an amazing library. So the library and the library is not just a place of books. It's a place where you meet people. I remember in my university in Ulster, we had a beautiful library where you don't just look at books, but you hang out with your friends. You have like a beautiful, beautiful computer lab and things like that. So I think that um, for me, the main uh, one of the main aspects of a, of a good university, of high quality university, and if I had just any money, I would make the most beautiful library in the world. Everything is like based on beautiful technology and things like that. Also, um, another important aspect is um, like an auditorium, like a really um, make a beautiful um, auditorium that um, connects uh, people together because the auditorium can be for giving workshops, giving conferences. And I feel it's very important as students um, to get that connection between other designers, not just the teachers that you have in the university. I remember I, whenever I was a student, I got a lecture from Alan Kitchen, which is a very famous uh, a typography designer. Um, and it was like amazing. Like Alan Kitchen was like so good. Like and I just loved him and I have his book here. So I do also, but like, I love the idea of like people, invited people can come in and give uh, lectures and, and talk to students also. And then the last one is, I think, uh, if I would go, it, the classrooms need to be um, uh, more in, interactive, I think. I think that when you're uh, in a classroom, you need to have the uh, uh, everything connected to a, a Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and everything connects together. So you have a learning experience that is the most dynamic that is possible. I think we're past the times where you use like whiteboards and markers and things like that. I think that more, everything now is based on like innovative uh, technologies and, and, and try to get a classroom where it's like a dynamic experience where you have like a, um, different ways of interacting with the students. So I would make an interdynamic and diverse classroom system where uh, people can learn in the best way that they can. Like the, the, each student has like maybe on the desk, they have like a computers that are set into the desks and everyone learns together. And, and we have a screen that connects and connects to audio experience, visual experience, interactivity experience, and everything moves forward and uh, is using that technology. And we're, and that's the thing is that I, what um, I like the last point I was going to say is I think sometimes education we're in ed, in the field of education we are afraid of technology um we're afraid that technology will take over education or something like that but i think that uh, in my experience the best uh, universities in the world use technology and they use the the platforms to improve the education with the students um so that would be the last one it would be, would be to use the technology to and improve the, the experience of the classroom to make it more interactive because you cannot just have a teacher explaining something to a student. It needs to be um, that uh, the students also interact with the experience also with the teacher and have a feedback and have a conversation because um, there's, a, there's a famous saying that in a classroom, not only the students learn, but the teacher, the teacher also. Um, and that is true. Um, you, but it needs to be both ways. So that that would be the the main way. And also, if I if I had all the money in the world, I would make education free, um, because I, I think that um, in Ecuador it's very expensive. The education very expensive, um, and lots of people can't study. Like they live in another part of the Ecuador where they literally want to be a graphic designer. They want to be an artist and they can't because they need to pay a lot of money to study in, in, in the universities. And if they don't have the money, they can't study. So they don't, can't get the title. They can't get their, their education and they go and do a, 
another another job that they don't want to do uh so that's that's um that's a, a bit disappointing so that's definitely something i would change in terms of um making education for everyone i was very lucky that i got to do my my title and my master's degree i paid on my own i worked i worked at the same time and i also did the master so i i paid the masters by myself but um but I understand that a lot of people can't even do that. I, there's lots of people in Ecuador here that can't do that because they, they don't have the, the money and the funding. And also there's no government uh, planning or schedule. Well, there is one, but it's not very good. That doesn't really, it doesn't really help the people. So um, that would be the, for me, education should always be free or a way of doing it that, um, um, that, that makes it more helpful, more more accessibly. Because in our society, there's the two most important jobs is a, a, like a doctor in medicine, nurses in that field, and also teaching. They're for me the two most important areas in, in our society. Because if we know medicine, no doctors, no nurses, everyone will get sick and die. <laughs> and if we have no education, we can't learn new things and we can't involve and improve as in a as in society. So um, that's a, what I would probably do um, with all the money in the world. <laughs> Fantastic. How can our viewers and listeners find you? So um, I have uh, my website, uh, which is the, um, with, I was going to say the Ecuador post um well, you actually can go ecuadorpostumena.com if you want. Oh, we're in construction of the website to get launched for 1st of August. But my personal work is on christopherscottdesigner.com. That's my website. I'm also on um, Instagram, Facebook. Um, I'm not on TikTok yet. Yeah, so maybe, yeah, you can follow me. Maybe I'm, I'm on TikTok, but I don't know. Um, so... Um, so yeah, I'm on Instagram. I'm on um, Facebook, Christopher Scott Designer. Um, I'm also on Twitter, uh, CS Graphy, which is, and but I'm not really. Um, I use Twitter sometimes, but not really as much. Instagram and Facebook is the most um, things that I'm on, um, and website obviously ChristopherScott.com. I'm uh, ChristopherScottDesigner.com, and also you can follow the Biennale um, on yeah. Aqu Aqua or Poster Biennale .com, which the the website's in process of uh, getting ready for the new edition. And also we are on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter on, and, and just put Aquara post in all and you, you'll find the project there. Wonderful, wonderful. And what is the, any last advice you'd like to leave us with? Last advice. Um, I always say to my students um, and all the people that I meet, they always say to me, Christopher, um, what's the key to being a good designer, what's the keys, uh, the what's the what's the tips and advice that you can that you can give us to be a good designer or to be a good professional? And for me, the key to everything is to work hard. Um, I always have a phrase that I whenever when I do conferences and workshops is that talent means nothing, and I believe everyone is creative in their own way. Um, it's but what what makes it a every, someone unique and what makes someone um, different is that the attitude and mentality they have um, and that's the key it's that's the key to being a good designer is to work hard work hard and work hard and um, also to have that curiosity and um, question why things the way they are in society why things look certain ways and um, that's also um, a key thing but the thing is, is is to work hard and and I work every day put all the work and effort in. Do I also play a bit? Of course, I have the PlayStation 5. I love playing video games, but I, I, I work really hard. And that's what I always say to my students. Um, they need to work really hard because to be honest, the industry of graphic design is not easy. People, they go into it thinking that it's just all oh, do some drawing, do some logos, but it's not that way at all. You need to work really hard um, to be a, what you want to be. Um, and that's the key to being um, successful and, and to be a good designer. Thank you so much for coming uh, today. We're looking really forward to seeing you at Design Education Forum this November. And, yeah, I'm looking uh, forward to it. 
looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you for a fantastic conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye.